Hello. What I want you to understand today, and if it's if there's nothing else you get from this talk, then I want you to understand this. That anybody who believes in Jesus, whether they're a Jewish believer in Jesus, a Protestant, a Hebrew Christian, a Catholic, a Messianic Jew, an Evangelical Christian, a Baptist, a Methodist, a, Me a Jew for Jesus. Whoever these people are, if they believe in Jesus, then they will, they will be worshipping him. I want you to think about that for a moment. They will be worshipping him. Now, the God of Israel has said to the Jewish people, I am the Lord your God, and you shall now have no other gods but me. I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods but me. Those of you who went to Cheder, you perhaps know the Shema, that all Jews say, whether you reform, whether you're from, whether you're Orthodox, whatever. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, it seems to me it might seem sufficient for God to just say, I am the Lord your God. Full stop. But he doesn't. He makes a point of telling us that he is one. 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 Now, why has he done that? What I want to suggest to you to, today is that maybe he told the Jewish people that he was one because he anticipated a time in the future when there would arise a belief from an individual within Judaism, somebody arising, a man who people believed was God in the flesh that the sect would grow, it would develop, it would become worldwide and people would be worshipping a man who they believe is God, right? Now Jesus said about himself, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen God. If you've seen me, you've seen God. Jesus cannot be considered remotely to go on any short list to be the Messiah because he himself discounts himself from being the Messiah because of the very things he says. Just the one statement. You don't have to have lots and lots of biblical knowledge. You don't have to know the scriptures inside out and back to front to work this out. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father. That he means God, but by me. So Jesus is saying to the Jewish people at that time in the Gospels, so that this is the belief that if pe the Jewish people want access to God, they've got to come through him. Right? Well, we all know we have direct access to God. But he's saying, you've got to come through me. There has never, ever been a time when any rabbi, any group, at any time in our history, and you can check this out yourself, when any rabbi, when any learned Jewish man has thought to themselves that the Messiah would be God in the flesh. Right? That God the God of Israel would make a Jewish woman pregnant with himself, that he would fertilize her egg, make 
the Jewish woman pregnant with himself, she would give birth to a human being that is actually God in the flesh, called the Son of God. That this child would grow up and he would die by crucifixion outside the temple and that Jewish people would have to put their faith in the blood and that this blood would cover all their sins, past, present and future, and that they would have eternal life and resurrection of the dead. There has never ever been any idea in Judaism, any time, any thought, and you know how creative we are as a people, Jewish people. There's never been an idea that this would be the Messiah. Never. And that also that the Jewish people would worship this Messiah. That the Jewish people would worship this Messiah. Right? Now you might think on the face of it, when Jews for Jesus say, quite reasonably, well why not consider that Jesus is the Messiah? And you might say, well maybe he is, you don't know, rabbis don't know everything, you know, maybe you should keep an open mind. But what I'm hoping to do, from what I've said today, is that you realise that he, he himself discounts himself from being the Messiah because of the very things he says. He believes he, he can forgive sins. Again, this has never been any expectation that the Messiah would forgive sins. And never, you know, supposedly Jesus says to the robbers on the cross, you will be with me in paradise and all this. There's never been an expectation that the Messiah would have that authority or role to be allocating who sits where in heaven and things. Now I want us to look at the nativity story, right? And what I'm going to say, you might find offensive, shocking in the way I express it, but I'm expressing it this way for a reason, because I want you to get what it's, what it's really all about, what it's saying, the actual theology of it. Now, what the, the, the New Testament is saying, the Gospels are saying that you've got this Jewish woman, Mary, She's betrothed, she's engaged to, to Joseph, and that the God of Israel wants to make Mary pregnant with himself because she wants Mary, this nice Jewish girl, Orthodox Jewish girl, who keeps everything and, you know, tries her best with her, with her uh, you know, when she gets married with her husband Joseph, to bring up, to give birth to this baby that will be God, right, the Son of God, right, and that he will grow up and that he will be divine. So she's going to give, a babe, give birth to a baby that is God in the flesh, right? So he's choosing a, a Jewish woman who obviously is going to Jewish woman that's going to that's orthodox, she's going to take him to shul, this child, she's going to, he's going to have a bar mitzvah, she, you know, they're going to do everything properly. Um, he's choosing a Jewish girl that wouldn't dream of sleeping with a man outside marriage, because an orthodox, orthodox Jewish girl wouldn't, they just don't, right? So it's, now, the way it's explained in the New Testament is that the way that Mary becomes pregnant is the Holy Spirit, that is the Spirit of God, comes upon Mary and somehow fertilises the egg. Right? So you've got the egg, the Holy Spirit comes down and fertilises it, and then it's growing. And what's growing is God. Is God. It's God. But obviously clothed in a human body, but it is actually God. Right? This is a belief. Now, on the face of it, we can all say, well, God's God, he can do anything. And that's what I used to think. Well, of course he can do anything. If he wants to make a woman pregnant, he can do. But we've got to look at this story. And we, we've got something to compare it to as well. Um, 
and ask ourselves, is this the way the God of Israel behaves? Everybody has a character and behaviour, and so does God. And we have to say, what is this story saying? And is what it's saying consistent with the way the God of Israel has worked in the past in the Hebrew Bible? Right? What this means when it's saying the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary's egg and fertilizes it, so that what she produces is God in the flesh. What it is actually saying is to, that they're turning God into almost like a sexual entity. So God is spirit. So in order for this egg to be fertilized, the only thing that can fertilize an egg is sperm. This is male sperm. There is nothing else that can fertilize this egg. Now, if the egg is not being fertilized by sperm coming from Joseph, where is the sperm coming from? Well, the only place it could come from is from God. Because the whole point of the story is this is supposed to be God in here. This is supposed to be God developing, right? You've got the egg and the sperm is supposed to be God's sperm. So what they're saying, what this story means is God is basically ejaculating inside Mary, right? The sperm's, the, the sperm from God has fertilized Mary's egg, right? In order to create the baby, because the baby's supposed to be God. So if it's supposed to be God, it's got to come from a sperm that comes from God. So this is about the sexualization of God, because it has to be a sperm that fertilizes the egg. There is nothing else that can fertilize an egg. And I know what you're going to say, well, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God can do it. But you have, again, we've got to get back is how is he doing it? And is this consistent with how he's behaved in the past to get women pregnant? How does a God get a woman pregnant? That's the question. How does a God get a woman pregnant? What is the mechanism? How does he do it? Right? If you look at the story of Abraham and Sarah, Abraham's an old man, right? Well, old men are still producing sperm. You get men in the 70s. They, they hook up with 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, and they're producing children. Oh, yes. There's, there won't be any problem with Abraham and his sperm. You know, men just... They can, they can produce babies at 80, they can produce babies at 85 if they can find a, a young woman who's ovulating, who's willing and everything. And they can be producing the babies. Uh, I was on Match.com, the dating site, when I was in my 50s, and there was a man of 70. And he wasn't interested in me. This was a Jewish man, incidentally. He wasn't interested in me at 55. He was 70. Oh, no. He wants a 20 to 30 year old because he's an old bachelor. He's never wanted to commit. And he suddenly thinks, I'm getting older. I need, you know, I need to leave my seed behind. I need to leave my, you know, dynasty. You know, so he's looking for a 20 to 30 year old in order to have intercourse with because he wants, he wants to leave a son behind. Right. So men, no matter how old they are, are producing sperm. Right? Now, the thing is, to make a baby, it's about, this, there's lots of sperm coming out. It's getting it to hit that egg. Now, so, um, Sarah's an old woman, but we have to ask the question, what is old? Now, I'm 61. When I was a child, old, to be honest, was 45. Old was 45, definitely. 45 and 50. Um, in, the, and, and in, 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 the, in the Second World War, at the extermination camps, people over 40 were, were sent to, to be gassed. They were considered old. And this sounds strange now, because we all think, well, 40 is not old, 40 is not old. But in those days, 40 was considered old. 
this is all dyed well yeah it is yeah this is this is if i let all this grow out what you'll be seeing is lots of gray hair right <laughs> right um the way women look nowadays in the 50s and 60s you know it's just amazing my late mother had me when she was 44 and that was considered old then and now it's still considered you know a little bit you know it's a bit old to have a child but so my mother was still ovulating right at 43 she gave birth to me at 44 um now as a child 45 and 50 was considered old people were considered old they looked old everybody looked old my father had completely grey hair there was nothing to dye it with people everybody everybody looked really old then and they dressed old and dowdy and um uh, and of course remember there were all the antibiotics and everything that can people take that can help uh, people live longer with you know uh, so what i'm suggesting to you is even though sarah is considered old perhaps old at 45 46 oh she's an old woman right you've got to ask where from what perspective that's coming from this idea she there could be still this she 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 could still be producing eggs if not a few eggs because when women stop menstruating right varies from woman to woman this is why you've got women like my late mother get suddenly getting pregnant at 44. I don't know if it was planned or not. You see, because a lot of women get to the 40s and they think, oh, I won't get pregnant now. I'm obviously too old. But then they do get pregnant. Surprising. Uh, so a woman could stop producing eggs at 40, but she might stop producing eggs at 48. We just don't know. It varies from individual to individual. So even if there was just one or two eggs there lingering about you know with sarah she's looking old she can see she's considered an old woman remember it you know old is like 40 40 to 45 was considered old when you're 20 40 45 is yeah it's really old isn't it yeah what's oh, old you know you know you, you try and think back when you were 18 and you're looking at a 45 50 year old they look old you see so it's it's all about what the what age is coming up in our minds when we think of old with sarah you see today we might think of old as an old woman sarah as about 80. but no 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 i would say that's the way we think now we think old means 80. Old means 70, 75. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It means in those days, it could still be 40, 45. She could still have eggs, if not many eggs. Uh, she could still be producing eggs. It's a question of, of that sperm hitting the eggs, right? It, it apparently get, can get harder as you get older. I'm not an expert in all of this, right? I'm just using common sense and I'm thinking of my late mother having me at 45. She was considered old. Um, my late, my, well, you know, when I, my, I only knew my late father with grey hair. Uh, but, you know, she, it was like, it was like my mother was my grand, grandparent. I mean, she looked old, you know, I'm telling you what I mean, but, she, you know, because that's how people looked in those days. You know, not it's not like nowadays. Uh, you know all the hair dyes and the face creams and all the advancement of antibiotics and all sorts no and facelifts and removing flesh and this and do it no no <laughs> everybody <laughs> i'm sure older people listening will know exactly what i mean so we've got we've got sarah who's probably perhaps middle-aged she's got some eggs uh she's she's they've, they've not been able to have a child um, now it could either be the man's fault or the woman's fault. We don't know. The text doesn't tell us who is responsible for this. 
infertility, for want of a better word. We, you know, you could say, well, maybe it's Abraham, he's not producing, or whatever. Or it could be, you could say it was Sarah's, Sarah, she, something, I don't know, I'm not an expert, I don't, we don't know, we don't know. But the way the God of Israel would have worked, and would be, he's got to get that sperm, because this is how life, this is how it works. He gets, he has to get that sperm to hit that egg. So if there's only one egg there, and you've got sperm floating over there, the God of Israel would be able to manoeuvre and direct that sperm to hit the egg. So it's like what's happening is the God of Israel is taking control of the sperm and getting it over here, not over there, because that's not where the egg is. The egg is here, right? It could be that he's got weak sperm, so... I don't know, but he's, it, the mechanism of making Sarah pregnant will be an egg and a sperm. And the sperm will come from Abraham because it's Abraham's seed, right? So Isaac will look like Abraham. And if he looks like Abraham, it's because of the seed, because it's coming from Abraham, so Isaac will say, oh, he just likes you, he looks like you, Abraham, right? Now, the belief is with Jesus, is that Jesus will not look like, obviously, he's not going to look like Joseph, because Joseph hasn't fertilised the egg. It's supposedly the Spirit of God. So who is he going to look like? Well, he might have Mary's eyes, but what has he got from the Father? If this sperm is coming from God, and this is what makes him, this causes the belief of Jesus being divine. So the sperm is actually, the, the belief is that the sperm is coming from God. So he's making a pregnant, right, Mary pregnant, by fertilizing the egg with himself. That's the way it's doing, that's what he's doing. He's the Holy Spirit is, to put it bluntly, is ejaculating. It's the only way it's got to come in, sperm, and hit that egg. Now, with the story of Abraham and Sarah, it's not the sperm of God. It's the sperm of Abraham, because God said it will come from your seed. Seed is from the, the semen. That's the seed in the, it's in the semen. This, that is it. It's Abraham's seed. It's not the seed coming from God. What God has done is directed it and giving it a shove. Go over here, don't go over there. Go over here. And somehow, I don't know what he's doing, but he's trying to get it all together. So it, she produces an embryo, right? So God is actually using physical matter. He's giving it a helping hand. That's what he's doing. He's kind of influencing it. He's got the material, but he's influencing it to get it to work, right? It's almost like a mechanic. It's like you've got the tools. We just got to fiddle around with it to get it connected. And he does it and it produces the baby. And this is a totally different story to the nativity story. Because the nativity story and the belief is that sperm is not human sperm. It's the sperm coming from God. And so the divinity story is sexualizing God. It's saying that the Holy Spirit has ejaculated and produced sperm to fertilize the egg. And it's God's sperm. And that's why they believe that the baby is God in the flesh. I'm explaining it bluntly like this because this is the only way you can do it. This is the only way. And this is a completely different way of working. This is God supposedly working in this situation like this. And then you've got the situation that I've just described of Abraham and Sarah. And you need to compare the nativity story also with other, the way God works in all the perhaps the famous Bible stories of the Jewish people. God sending manna from heaven. Um, water from the rock. The water was there. 
how does God d dividing the Red Sea? It's not impossible with today's technology. If you're standing at, say, on the shore, on a beach, to get the equipment, I, I'm not a technical person, you get the equipment and you want to create a pathway, right? So you get the equipment to create a pathway, right? And it is physically possible to do that. So you can create a gap where people can walk through. With new technology, you push the waters back a bit and then people can walk, toddle through, right? So it's not impossible. But the way the God of Israel worked, he's, he, was, he was doing something. He's extending what is possible, but which is again at the same time impossible. So he's taking control of physical matter. He's taking control of the sea and dividing it. Now that is not impossible to do in today's world. With technology, as I said, it's easy. you can push it back and then people could walk through. So we need to think about what is a miracle? What, de what, what defines a miracle according to the Hebrew Bible? And we have to say, does this, is this consistent with the nativity story? Or is the nativity story something completely different? And in my view, it's totally obscene. Because the belief is that the baby that's born, obviously it's got a body, is God in the flesh. Now, why did the three wise men come to visit Jesus, baby Jesus? They came to visit baby Jesus to worship him. They came to worship him. This is not like people visiting a new baby. You know, oh, how's the new baby? It's not like a Brit. It's not like a circumcision where everybody wants to house the baby. Is the baby sleeping? The baby looks like you. No, 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 no. Nobody goes to a Brit. Nobody goes to visit a new mum in hospital to worship a baby. People go there just they want to see the baby. They're not going to worship the baby. But here in the story, we're told that these men come specifically to worship the baby. Now, only God is to be worshipped. Only God is to be worshipped. Because God himself has instructed the Jewish people, I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods but me. You shall have no other gods but me. And throughout the prophets, throughout the Hebrew Bible, one of the complaints about from God, time and time again, is that the Jewish people were reverting to idolatry. Right. You have to remember that before the, the revelation and before the revelation of God to the Jewish people and before Abraham himself believed in God, because uh, uh, Abraham was an idol worshipper. So it comes, it's the whole concept, the whole idea of one God comes from the Jewish people. It comes from God making himself known to this particular small group of people to say, I am God. And I am in charge of everything. Now, in the ancient world, people believed in, they believed there was a God for everything. There was a God for the sun. There was a God for the sea. There was a God for the wind. There was a God for hail. There was a God for agriculture. There was a God for fertility, right? People saw it like a city council, where you have different departments, different gods responsible for different things. I was once at a lecture, and a, 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 the, the, uh, the lecturer brought in a very small, it was very, very small, little clay penis, a man's clay penis. It was very small, and that, that we must have been dug up somewhere, some agriculture, and he, he, he got hold of it, I don't know, he's obviously taking it to all his lectures, showing everybody, because everybody laughs, you see. But, um, so he's got this little clay penis, and what it what it was in the in in times previous times, people would present clay clay um, things of different parts of the body that were ailing them, whether it would be an eye, an arm, a hand, 
whatever and they present it to the god responsible for eyes or the god responsible for health the god responsible for feet i think you know whatever and then the god would look at this clay penis or clay hand and they would know what the problem is you see and then they would help the person this was the belief that you people did that they would make clay things of different parts of the anatomy and present it to the appropriate god so you can't blame people for thinking like this because people thought um right i've got to put the battery in is it not in um so people thought people thought to pick of, of like like well you can't have one god uh, running the world obviously that's how people thought they thought you, you have lots of gods all responsible like a city council and so the children of israel themselves had to learn that this god that they believed in was could do everything they didn't have to go to other gods this god of israel could provide water remember water from the rock from you know go to cheder you know water from the rock which was already present in the rock the rock was there it was what happened was god released it the water was already there it's the god of israel does not work by magic he uses what's already there the water was in the rock the chickens were already up there flying about he just redirected them go over here to where the children of israel are and they flopped down whatever dead all these chickens it's not magic it is god taking control of the elements the god of israel taking control so he's taking control he's taking control of this jew this 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 that, that grew in the mornings that was that was called manna that tasted very nice apparently right again this is physical matter this is not magic this is god taking control and managing the universe what's already there and he's doing things that surprise us and we don't expect and why is this gone off 